This tutorial will demonstrate how to connect analog sensors to the Raspberry Pi, specifically water detectors, level, and pressure sensors. However, the skills can be applied to connecting other types of analog devices such as potentiometers, photoresistors, and temperature sensors. My videos tend to be quick paced, but all the code, notes, and updates are available on my website, and a link will be placed in the video description. Unlike Arduinos, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have an ADC, which stands for Analog to Digital Converter. An ADC measures voltage on a pin and translates it to a number. Most devices that you connect to the Raspberry Pi are either digital or analog. For example, in a previous video I demonstrated the DHT22 temperature humidity sensor. It's a digital sensor. When it's 25.2 degrees, the DHT22 will send the Pi the number 25.2. At a low level, the communication is ones and zeros or highs and lows, but the associated software libraries are usually user-friendly. On the other hand, analog sensors will usually change voltage or resistance depending on the reading. The Coolant Sen AP006G temperature sensor, which I used in my liquid-cooled computer monitor, acts as a variable resistor. Its resistance changes as the temperature changes. It can be used with a fixed resistor to generate an analog voltage. At 25.2 degrees, it has a resistance of about 49k ohms. The vendor provides a chart so you can look up the corresponding temperature from the resistance. Unlike the digital DHT22, it presents an analog signal and you need an ADC to read it, and there are both extra hardware and software steps to get the same results. So why use an analog sensor if it's more work and the Pi doesn't have an ADC? Among other reasons, they're often easier to get and they may be cheaper. Sometimes there isn't a digital equivalent. Here's an analog water level and analog pressure sensor that I got on eBay. I did search around for comparable digital equivalents, but this is the best I could find at a reasonable price. Both devices output a voltage on the S pin, which corresponds to a water level or a pressure value. I'm going to hook them up in my house to warn me if there's a leak and to monitor the pressure of the plumbing system. There are three approaches you can take to connect analog devices to the Pi. You could try an RC charging circuit, but it would only work with sensors that act like resistors, such as the coolants. The circuit counts the program cycles required to charge a capacitor, which varies depending on resistance. These circuits work better on microcontrollers than on socks. They tend to be inaccurate on the Pi because its operating system can interfere with the counting, especially in Python and on multi-core chips. Because of this, I won't be demonstrating this approach. Another solution is to use a microcontroller with an ADC, such as an Arduino. It can pull the analog sensor and transmit the results to the Pi. This is a more advanced technique, and I already covered it in my previous video, Raspberry Pi AVR Programmer and Spy Tutorial. Therefore, this video will focus on dedicated ADC chips such as the MCP3002 and the ADS1115. These devices are inexpensive and very easy to use. Let's take a look at the wiring for the MCP3002. I'll be using an older Raspberry Pi A because I'm juggling several projects. However, this solution will work on any Pi. The MCP3002's VDD pin goes to 3.3 volts on the Pi, and the VSS goes to a ground pin. The DIN pin goes to GPIO 10 on the Pi, which is MOSI, master out, slave in. The D out pin goes to GPIO 9, which is MISO, master in, slave out. The CLK pin goes to GPIO 11, which is SOC, serial clock. CS goes to GPIO 8, which is chip enable, zero, often called chip select. Before connecting the sensor, I'll test the chip with the potentiometer set up as a voltage divider. One end terminal goes to ground and the other to 3.3 volts. It doesn't matter which, swapping them would just flip the direction of the dial. The wiper terminal is connected to CH0 on the MCP3002, which is one of the two ADC input channels. On a small breadboard, I have an MCP3002 chip. VDD is connected to a 3.3 volt power rail. VSS is connected to a ground rail. Here's a 1K ohm potentiometer. One end terminal is connected to 3.3 volts, and the other is connected to ground. The seventh pin on the MCP3002 clock is connected to the Pi's GPIO 11 sock. The sixth pin, D out, is connected to GPIO 9 MISO. The fifth pin, D in, goes to GPIO 10 MOSI. Pin 1, CS, goes to GPIO 8 chip enable. These four connections comprise the wiring for the hardware spy communications. The POTS wiper is connected to ADC channel 0 on the MCP3002. Turning the dial on the POT will vary the voltage to the ADC from 0 to 3.3 volts. Lastly, a 3.3 volt pin from the Pi is connected to the 3.3 volt rail, and a ground pin is connected to the ground rail. Okay, the hardware is good to go for the first test. Next, the software. I recommend you follow my tutorials with a fresh install of the latest version of Raspbian. I'm using Jesse with the Pixel desktop environment, which has many great new features. In a terminal, let's start by making sure the Pi is up to date with sudo apt-get update, 
and sudo apt-get upgrade. The MCP3002 ADC chip communicates via SPI. This version of Jesse already has the Python SPI dev library installed, so we're good to go on the software. We just need to enable SPI. From the Pi's menu, click Preferences, Raspberry Pi Configuration. Click the Interface tab and enable the SPI interface. The ADS1115 uses I2C, so I'll enable it too. I have more detailed videos on both SPI and I2C communication protocols if you're interested. I don't think a reboot is necessary, so we'll go straight to idle. Fortunately, the latest version of Raspbian no longer requires super user privileges to access the GPIO pins, which simplifies things. I'll create a new blank Python file and save it in the documents folder as waterdetector.py. From the time library, sleep is imported. A spy dev library is imported to handle spy communication. A spy object is instantiated on bus zero, device zero. The maximum communication speed is set to 250,000 Hertz. Adafruit does make a library for the MCP3008, which is similar to the 3002 but with 8 channels. However, during testing I found it's currently not completely compatible. Therefore, we'll just create our own method called pulse sensor to handle reading values from the MCP3002. It's passed a channel argument which can be 0 or 1 because this chip supports two ADC inputs. It returns a value between 0 and 1023. ADC chips are usually rated for accuracy in bits. The MCP3002 is 10 bit, which equals 2 to the 10th power or 1024 possible values. Assert is used to ensure the channel argument is 0 or 1. If the channel equals 1, then the byte pattern is set appropriately. Otherwise, the byte pattern for channel 0 is set. These values come from the data sheet. The SPI X for 2 method is called with 3 bytes. One for single, which just returns the voltage. You can also perform a differential reading, which measures the voltage potential between the two channels. C byte tells the MCP3002 which channel to read, then 0 for most significant bit first. The X for 2 method returns 3 bytes. The 10 bit ADC value we want is comprised of bits 13 through 22, so some bitwise code is used to return the relevant portion only. The main while loop is wrapped in a try statement to catch errors. It'll run until interrupted. Channel is set to 0. The pulse sensor method above is called passing the channel. Voltage is calculated. Channel data is multiplied by 3300 for 3300 millivolts, then divided by 1024 for 10 bits. Print displays the voltage to the console and the raw 10 bit data value. The loop pauses for 2 seconds and then repeats. Finally, is used to gracefully close the program and ensure the SPI interface is properly closed. On the breadboard, the pod is all the way at one end and the shell shows 0 volts and 0 for the data. Turning the dial clockwise to the other extreme gives us 3280 millivolts, pretty close to 3.3 volts, and 1018 for data. Turning the dial back near the center position gives us 1785 millivolts, 1679 millivolts, and 521 for the data, which sounds about right. The values will level off, but will fluctuate a little, so it's often a good idea to take a few readings and average them. Okay, now for the water level sensor, which is connected similarly to the pot. The plus pin goes to 3.3 volts and the minus pin goes to ground. The S pin goes to an ADC. I'll use channel 1 this time. Back on the breadboard, I'll connect the water sensor. The black minus wire goes to ground and the orange plus wire goes to 3.3 volts. And the yellow S wire goes to channel 1 on the MCP3002. For visual feedback, let's add a dual color LED red green to the circuit. The green anode is connected through a 330 ohm resistor to GPIO 14, and the red anode is connected through another 330 ohm resistor to GPIO 15. The common cathode is connected to ground. The dual color LED is placed on the breadboard. It's actually triple colored because if you turn on both red and green, you get yellow. The LED common cathode pin goes to ground. A 330 ohm resistor is added to the green anode. Another 330 ohm resistor is added to the red anode. The green anode is connected to GPIO 14 on the Pi. Unlike SPI, it doesn't matter which GPIO pins you pick for the LED, as long as you specify them correctly in the code. OK, finish by connecting the red anode to GPIO 15. Now let's update the code. RPI GPIO is imported. The mode is set to BCM for Broadcom numbering. GPIO setup sets pin 14 as an output. This is the green LED. And 15 is set to output for the red LED. After the print statements, logic is added for the LED color. If the voltage is less than 50 millivolts, the LED will be illuminated green by setting 14 high and 15 low. Else, if the voltage is less than 1800 millivolts, then the LED will be yellow by setting both 14 and 15 high. 
Otherwise, the 14 will be low and the 15 will be high, which sets the LED to red. Finally, we make sure the GPIO is cleaned up upon exit. Oh, and I almost forgot. The channel needs to be changed from 0 to 1 because this sensor is on channel 1. Okay, the sensor is resting in an empty cup and I'll start the program. The LED lights up green indicating no water present. I'll add just a little bit of water to the cup. The LED is now yellow. It's not easy filming red LEDs, so watch the LED carefully as I add more water. Okay, I know it probably looks orange on the video, but it is indeed red now. When I remove the sensor from the water, the LED turns yellow because the PCB is still a little wet. Wipe it in with my fingers, and it's back to green. This particular sensor is not very accurate for water level, but it's great if you just need to detect the presence of water, such as a plumbing leak. For the pressure sensor hookup, I'll use an ADS-1115 breakout board. It has four channels with 15-bit accuracy. That's 32,768 values compared to 1,024 on the MCP-3002. It sports a power supply from 2 to 5.5 volts, which is good because my analog pressure sensor requires 5 volts. I'll use an Adafruit level shifter between the 3.3 volt Raspberry Pi and the ADS-1115 running at 5 volts. It may not be necessary, but I think it's a good practice in terms of reliability. Also, it's important to use a level shifter rated for I2C communications. Please note I switched over to a Raspberry Pi 2 for this segment, but again, this project will work on any Pi. A 3.3 volt pin from the Pi is connected to the level shifter LV pin, lower voltage. A 5 volt pin from the Pi is connected to the level shifter HV pin, higher voltage, and also to the VCC on the ADS-1115. A ground pin from the Pi is connected to both devices. The Pi's SDA and SCL, which are GPIO 2 and 3, are connected to A1 and A2 on the level shifter. The ADS-1115 SDA and SCL are connected to B1 and B2 on the opposite side of the level shifter. The pressure sensor is added. Minus goes to ground, plus goes to 5 volts, and the S-wire goes to A0, which is ADC channel 0 on the ADS-1115. Instead of an LED, we'll use an LCD display for feedback. The LCD VCC and backlight anode are connected to 5 volts. The LCD ground, contrast, read-write, and backlight cathode are connected to ground. The LCD doesn't need to go through the shifter because it's a write-only device. Just make sure you ground the read-write pin. RS goes to 25, E goes to 24, data 4 through 7 goes to GPIO 23, 18, 15, and 14, respectively. On a breadboard, I have an ADS-1115, the Adafruit I2C Safe Level Shifter, and a 16x2 LCD display. The ADS-1115 VCC is connected to a 5 volt rail. The ground is connected to the ground rail. The Level Shifter HV Higher Voltage Pin is connected to 5 volts. The ground pin is connected to ground. The LCD display VCC is connected to 5 volts and the ground is connected to ground. The read-write pin is grounded to ensure write only. The backlight anode is connected to 5 volts. The level shifter LV lower voltage pin is connected to a 3.3 volt pin on the Pi. It'd be safer to do this with the Pi turned off. The Pi's SDA pin GPIO2 is connected to A1 on the lower voltage side of the level shifter. SCL GPIO3 is connected to A2 on the shifter. B2 is connected to SCL on the ADS-1115 to complete the SCL line. B1 is connected to SDA to complete the SDA line. The shifter now sits between the Pi and the ADS-1115 and will shift the voltage levels appropriately. On the schematic, I just grounded the contrast and backlight cathode, but the display is a little bright for filming, so I'm going to add a 1000 ohm resistor between contrast and ground to reduce the contrast, and a 390 ohm resistor between the backlight cathode and ground to reduce the brightness. I could have also used variable resistors, but I'm trying to keep it simple. RS goes to GPIO 25, Enable goes to 24, and Data 4 through 7 goes to GPIO 23, 18, 15, and 14 respectively. Unlike the SPI and I2C wires, you can use any pins for the LCD control and data lines as long as you just specify the selected pins in your code. A ground pin from the Pi is connected to the breadboard ground rail and a 5 volt pin is connected to the 5 volt rail. I've taken the pressure sensor and screwed it into a brass T with an air coupler and a pressure gauge to check the results. This sensor will work with air or liquid, so I'll use an air compressor to test it. Typically in electronics, red is positive and black is ground. 
Initially, I thought the sensor was broken and it didn't come with any docks. But after a little headache, I realized that they used white for ground and black for the sensor output. Anyway, the red sensor wire is connected to the breadboard 5 volt rail and the white to the ground rail. The black sensor output wire goes to ADCA0 on the ADS1115. I added some blue heat shrink to the black wire and black heat shrink to the white wire so I don't get confused. Adafruit provides a Python library for the ADS1115 that works great and it's easy to use. I'll open a terminal and use pip to install the Adafruit-ADS1x15 library. Adafruit also provides a great Python library for LCD displays, which I demonstrated in one of my first videos. It's now even easier to install. Again, just use pip to install the car LCD library. Before going any further, it's a good idea to test the I2C communications with sudo I2C detect y1. The matrix shows that a single I2C device is connected properly at hex address 48. I'll open idle from the desktop and create a new Python file. Save it in documents and call it pressuremonitor.py. From time, sleep is imported. The Adafruit car LCD library is imported. An LCD is instantiated with the selected GPIOs, 25 for RS, 24 for enable, 23, 18, 15, and 14, for data 4 through 7. Also 16 for columns and 2 for lines because this is a 16 by 2 display. The Adafruit ADS 1x15 library is imported. An ADC is instantiated at hex address 48 which we got from the I2C detect utility and the bus number is 1. On some older pies the bus could be 0. The gain is set to 2 thirds which is for reading voltages up to 6.144 volts. Table 3 in the datasheet has different gain values if you're reading lower voltages. Please note that you should never allow voltages higher than the VDD pin to come in contact with an ADC channel. Since we're running the ADS1115 at 5 volts, it could be damaged if we try to measure a voltage more than about 5.3 volts. The main loop will run until interrupted. The ADC read ADC method is used to pull the sensor. Channel 0 and gain are passed as arguments. Volts are calculated from the return value by dividing by 32,767 for 15 bits and then multiplying by 6.144, the maximum gain voltage. After initial testing, I determined that there was a linear relationship between PSI and voltage. Y equals mx plus b can be used to determine the line equation. If your math is rusty, webmath.com has an online calculator. You just need two points. From testing, I know the voltage is 1 volt at 25 PSI and 2 volts at 75 PSI. Click Find the Equation. You don't just get the equation, you get a complete explanation of how to solve for the equation. And the equation to convert voltage to PSI is y equals 50x minus 25. Therefore, PSI is equal to 50 times volts minus 25. If you prefer bar, we'll give those results too, which is a simple conversion. The LCD display is cleared. The message method displays voltage and the data value on the top line. Backslash n switches to the bottom row, which displays PSI and bar. The loop sleeps for one second and repeats. Okay, I run the program. With the air valve off, the display shows a little over half a volt and 2 PSI or 0.1 bar. I was expecting zero, but it's close. It may need calibration or the 2 PSI may be due to the high elevation here. As I turn up the air, the gauge and the display reading seem to be tracking very well. 18 psi on the display, 1.2 bar, and about 16 on the gauge. 37 psi on the display, and 36 on the gauge. 58, and almost 57. I'll open the tank all the way. 103 psi on the display, 7.1 bar, and approximately 103 on the gauge. These results are well within the margin of error for my project. Removing the air and the display goes back down to 1 PSI. I really appreciate all the positive feedback and I'm trying to increase the frequency that I release new videos. You can support this channel by subscribing and leaving a like. Thanks for watching.